and welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna, brought to you by Loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and this is our 30th full-length episode. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for your continued support. Now, you're probably wondering why we're releasing episode 30, and it's not a Tuesday, <laughs> especially taking into consideration that we've got the Leicester City game coming up on Monday night, but there is a reason for it. There is a method to my madness, and that is because this is a Chronicles of Aguna special. We'll also be releasing another podcast on Wednesday morning full of reaction to the Leicester City game, so do not fear. We will be covering that off too. But back to the here and now. I'm joined on this episode by a brilliant guest, and I know I say this all the time, but this time We really do have a special guest with us. This gentleman has won two league titles and a league cup playing for our beloved Arsenal and is without doubt a cult hero amongst the Gunners faithful. He made over 150 appearances for the club and scored 21 goals during a six-year period. Since hanging up his boots, he's become a well-established pundit working for some of the country's biggest media firms, including Sky Sports, BBC Radio 5 Live, BT Sport, and of course, Talk Sport. It's none other than Mr. Perry Groves. Perry, welcome to the show. I'm absolutely thrilled to have you uh, join me this evening and looking forward to talking all things Arsenal with you. First of all, how you doing, mate? I'm good. Uh, I'm not as sure as I am to be on your show and your world-renowned podcast. So it's an <laughs> honour for me as well. No, don't be silly. The honour is all ours. Uh, the honour is ours indeed. Um, Perry, I want to start off by asking you about Play With A Legend. Um, I understand you're one of the co-founders. Do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about it? Because having done my research, I'm sure it's something that a lot of them will be interested in. Yeah, what, what it, it stemmed from, I got asked uh, to play in a five-side competition, uh, five-side uh, stag um, for my, who's now partner, Josh, who runs it with me, is one of his friends. And he said he was a massive Arsenal fan. Um, we couldn't get hold of Paul Merson, so I was the next best choice. So that was pretty good. <laughs> so I played, turned up and played in, the, in this um, sort of stag five. So I had a great time, had a few beers. Then uh, myself and Nigel Winterburn got asked to play in uh, one at Chesham as well, you know, one on each side. And we did that. And me and uh, Josh and myself both come up with the idea that there's a business in there somewhere, you know, for ex-players to actually playing, whether it be stags, whether it be birthdays, whether it be um, special occasions. Um, and then it just sort of uh, snowballed from there. Now we've got, I think if you look at the website, which is obviously playwithlegend.com, um, I think there's probably about 120 ex-players on there that range from, you know, sort of just recently retired one, sort of the Teddy Sheridan and uh, sort of uh, Matt Letizia, uh back to old husbands um, like myself, oh, you know, wow. and all you know, so... Yeah, like people like Tony Cotty and um, uh, sort of Pat Nevin, like Chelsea. And it, but we go all around the country. So anybody who's got, you know, uh, who supports their uh, favourite football team, they've got a favourite player, they phone us up. We see if we can put it together. Uh, it could be a Cheltenham player. You know what I mean? You could be a fan of Cheltenham yeah. and it'd be their favourite uh, favorite player. And we turn up and it's a real unique occasion. It has, it has a wow factor because... Nine times out of ten, that the stag or whose birthday it is, or you know, the special occasion, they don't know. So, wow. like, it just the, you know, the ex player will just sort of burst into the into the changing room. So, Darren Anderton's, the you know, only place for that mob, but he's uh, <laughs> he's very popular because of Euro '96, and you know, a lot of lads of that age now. So he's um, fit now then to play, um, is he? <laughs> yeah, he's he's all right. He's got over his um, his, his cold that he had for fifteen years. Actually, if you look at sticking up for him, to be fair, look at his record. He played over five hundred games, so he gets a, a bit of a bit of a raw deal pressing uh, Darren. But he's a lovely. He's a real for one of them. He's a real nice geezer. Yeah, um, <laughs> they lads have a few. All, all part. It's all part of like the playing's great. You know, everybody runs around like nutters for the first. 25, 30 minutes, and then it goes into walking football. But the big part of it is uh, all the players have to stay afterwards. And they, they have a, like, they're around for about an hour and a half, and nine times out of ten, it's a stag party going, look, mate, can you go home now? We're going out. You know what I mean? so, and they're all good characters, all got stories to tell. We'll have a few pints. And that's, 
you know, that's a, a big part of it as well. So um, it's been going for about five years now. Um, wow. and it's going really, really well. Good. Sounds great. I wish I knew about it when I had my stag, to be honest. Uh, I'd have loved to uh, put my wits against yourself and Nigel on the football pitch and uh, see how I get on. Um, I also understand that you guys have recently started holding events in the Arsenal hub as well, ahead of some home games. What's that all about? And can you tell us when the next one is? Yeah, again, uh, the next one's uh, the Liverpool game, I think is November the 3rd. That's right. Um, yep. So there's the hub, what you mentioned there is the indoor facility is right next to the Emirates, like the uh, indoor five-a-side pitch. Um, so on the 3rd, we've got Nigel Winterburn playing. Again, it's for um, you know Arsenal fans or football fans in general. You get there before the game. Um, you have a little chat, obviously, in the, in the changing room. Then you uh, play with Nigel. I think it's about an hour. And you know, like seven aside. Then afterwards, we've got our own reception room where you can have a few beers, you know, a couple of glasses of Prosecco. Nigel stays and had a chat with you for about an hour and a half. So, it's a, again, it's a very, very unique experience. And, you know, you can obviously have a look at that on our website as well, on Play of Legends. It will come up there. So, it's um, we're going to involve, like, Paul Merson's going to be involved in the couple. And then uh, maybe Ray Parler will play. Maybe I'll put on the Giacomo XXXXL <laughs> shorts and have a little kick around. So, yes, yeah, so again, it's just another unique experience which enhances your match day experience. Yeah, no, it sounds absolutely fantastic. And we'll be sure to include the website details in the description of this podcast. So if you don't remember it by the end of the show, do check it out. It will be listed underneath. Um, make sure you do have a good look. Um, I had a look the other day and I was really pleasantly surprised to, to have a look at it and see how many players you've got on your books, especially even non-Arsenal players. So, you know, you cater for everybody and I think it's a fantastic yes. concept. And it's every... Um football team in the United Kingdom is a you know, professional football team is covered um, brilliant and you'll, you'll love this looking at it because it's all the old Panini stickers which is quite funny there's a lot <laughs> people ain't got any hair anymore so it's even funnier <laughs> lovely great stuff now Perry moving on to your career now it began at Colchester United a club that I'm sure you still hold in very high esteem. How did the transfer to Arsenal come about because with all due respect you know a jump from Division 4 to Division 1 was huge wasn't it yeah, it was massive. And I got to admit, there was a lad up front uh, for Colts United called Tony Adcock. We were like the, the ginger terrors. I was on the <laughs> sort of on the right wing, and he was scoring bundles of goals up front. And a lot of scouts were coming to watch him, to be honest, because he was scoring 25, 30 goals a season. And we used to play on a Friday night, so all the scouts used to come as well. So, you know, the director's box was always full. So me and him were making names for ourselves. And I got tapped up by Crystal Palace about two weeks before I, um, I came to the Gooners. And they phoned me up. Uh, it was Alan, not Big Nose Alan Smith. It was their coach, Alan Smith, <laughs> phoned me up uh, and said, uh, Perry, we've watched you play. You're really quick. We've got a young, exciting team at Palace. They were in the second division at the time. And he said, um, we're going to put some sort of desire and heart back into our team. We're going for pace. Want to, want, they wanted to play me up front. And God knows why they wanted to do that. Because I couldn't hit cows backside of a banjo. <laughs> they said, right, want you to play up front. And we found this, this raw young talent from Sunday uh, league football in the south of uh, London called Ian Wright. So God knows what happened to him. I don't know. I, I will see my career went on to stellar things. And I don't know what happened to that lad, Ian Wright. I don't know what he went to. So His name rings a bell, but I can't just think. I can't think. It rings yeah. a bell, though. But that was it. That was going to play me up front right. It was unknown then. It's just, you know, it's just weird how your career paths cross, you know. So, But then my uh, financial advisor phoned me up on September the 2nd uh, and said, uh, Perry, uh, You've been sold out because I was on the transfer list because I just wanted to prove myself. You know that I was, I, I was without being beginning. I was too good for Colchester. You know I, I wanted to go and prove myself at a higher level. And he said Arsenal have made a bid for you. And I, my second word for him was off because he knew that I was a massive gooner. And um, you don't, you know, when people say that you dream to go to. I didn't. I never dreamt of going to Arsenal because as you said there, you don't go from fourth division Colchester United to one of the biggest clubs in the world. So um, he said, yeah, we got up on Thursday. Um, which was obviously September 4th. And I went, yeah, right, yeah, I'll see you at the train station. I, I know I'm going to Crystal Palace. <laughs> so we was on the train from Colchester into Liverpool Street. Then we got jumped on the tube um, from uh, Liverpool Street uh, to Holborn and changed on the Piccadilly line. And I said to him, John Hazel, he's not with us anymore, bless him, but I said, John, this ain't funny anymore, mate. He said, now you're being cruel. You know what I mean? I said, you know, you're winding me up. I know I'm going for Crystal Palace. I'm going to Crystal Palace. And... Um, we went to um, Arsenal Tube Station. We turned left, turned right into Arsenal Road. And, I, and in my head, I, I, it, it sort of read so I know what we're doing. Because it's uh, a South London club, we're having a clandestine meeting in North London. You know what I mean? <laughs> so no one knows sort of what's going on. Not anybody knows anyway. 
But then we walked up uh, Avonall Road, up the slope to the, the Marbles Halls. And in the old days, they used to have a commissionaire stand outside with all the, the you know, the regalia on and his, his cap and uh, his braided sort of jacket. And he said, good morning, Mr. Hazel. Uh, welcome to the Emirates. And I thought, oh, that's a bit weird. You know, was his name. And he went, good morning, Mr. Groves. Welcome. When I looked at him and I thought, he knew my name. He just <laughs> said my name. How did you know my name? And that's when it sort of clicked in. That's where it clicked in. That uh, They'd bid for me, uh, I think it was 35 grand. Um, and then I walked up like the famous marble steps up to George Graham's office. And uh, it was like uh, the Wizard of Oz. You know when you see the Wizard of Oz and he sat in that massive chair? <laughs> yeah. So he was in a massive chair and he put me on like a little milking stool. So he was looking down at me. <laughs> and I don't really, I can't remember what he said to be honest because there was no negotiation. If I'm going to turn that off, you know. So, um, And then I phoned my dad up from the uh, telephone box across the road. Obviously there's no mobiles in those days. Yeah. And I said, Dad, I've just signed to Arsenal. And his, his second word was off. <laughs> he went, yeah, right, you know. He said, no, I have. Honestly, he went, yeah, whatever. He said, go to the Palace. I said, Dad, I've just signed for Arsenal. I said, I've made it. And he, to this day, I can remember he went, no, no, sunshine, you haven't made it. He said, you're just starting. You're on the bottom row. He said, you've got to work your way into that team now. And, and that was it. That's great advice, though, to keep your feet on the ground, isn't it? That's, that's what you kind of need to hear, I think, as a young footballer. Um, so... Signed for Arsenal, George Graham's first signing, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, first signing. I, um, I was on 150 quid a week at Colchester, and I went up to 350 quid a week at Arsenal, and I thought I was a millionaire. I bought to buy <laughs> helicopters and speedboats and whatever. Um, and then uh, I had a three-year contract, which I'd never had before. It was always at Colchester. You always went from year to year. Yep. Um, and I had, uh, he said, you have 150 quid appearance money if you get in the first team. He said, but don't worry about that, because you ain't getting nowhere near it for at least a year. <laughs> I said, all right, thanks for that. Um, and I think it was five grand signed on fee. Um, and it was 350 quid a win, uh, you know, if you got any said, but don't worry about that because you won't be in the first team. So you've got to go and prove yourself from reserves first. So, yeah, was, so that was it. I had a three-year contract. It was heavily focused on bonuses back then, then, wasn't it, compared to nowadays? Oh, the bonuses, we said, well, I was on 350 quid a week and we got 350 quid uh, win bonus if you wow. got in the first team. So, you know, I mean, you, you never play football. I never, ever play football for money. I played football because I loved football and I wanted to be as good as I could be. And then the money is an ad, you know what I mean? Then you're, you're privileged to be paid to play football. I mean, it's a privileged job. Yeah. You're getting paid for your hobby. So, um, but put it this way, there wasn't, if you look at the injuries now when people out, there wasn't as many injuries back then. If your ankle was hanging off and you needed 25 stitches and your, your Achilles was sticking out, you'd still play on the Saturday because yeah. you didn't want anybody taking your place. Completely different era, wasn't it? Completely different. Um, Perry, how would you describe working under George Graham? I'll be honest, I don't remember George Graham at Arsenal. I'm a bit too young. <laughs> but right. I always hear stories from my dad and from sort of older relatives and stuff about how organised and how regimented he was compared to Arsene Wenger, because that's all I've known. So there'll always be that comparison. But from someone who worked under him firsthand, how would you describe it? Um, respect, fear... Um, wonderment sometimes at how tactically brilliant he was um, it, and it was amazing because all the Arsenal fans of uh, the 70s would tell you that he was, he was nicknamed the stroller and he was like a luxury player but he didn't have he, he, it was poacher term gamekeeper he didn't have any luxury players if you didn't work you weren't playing yeah. and we were schooled and coached to uh, an inch of our lives we knew I, I knew how to play at right back I knew how to play at left back I knew how to play well, some people don't think I can play, but I don't play wide, I don't play up front. But we, we did the same training every day. We knew it was a Monday, we knew it was a Tuesday. We went and got like, uh, drunk on Tuesday afternoons. That was great. It was a Tuesday club. <laughs> the Tuesday club. Off yeah. Wednesday, yeah, and we knew what we were doing Thursday. All on high energy pressing. And this thing now with like Guardiola and Klopp, about that, and you have this gang of pressing and oh my God, someone's invented. We were doing that in 86, 87. We, that was our game. We were closing down, showing people inside. Um, so he, he was a tactical genius and he, he very rarely got stuff wrong he did laterally in his manager career we started signing average players but if you think uh, and it's very similar to Unai Emery at the moment whereby um, the club was a little bit too comfortable you know what yeah. I mean we had brilliant players but uh, on big money but underachieving we had players like um, Kenny Shantam and Charlie Nicholas uh, Steve Williams Liv Anderson Graham Ricks so he gradually eased all of those big earners out because he didn't want anybody earning more than what he, he was. <laughs> um, and then he brought in 
the youth team uh, players, if, if you think now, coming through the academy system, if you had David Rocastle, Michael Thomas, Paul Merson, Tony Adams, Noel Quinn, Martin Hayes, Paul Davis, um, he gave them all, all their go in the first team. And then he went and signed, the recruitment was brilliant because he went and signed uh, Lee Dixon from um, Stoke, Steve Bold from Stoke, yep. Nigel Winterburn from Wimbledon, Alan Smith from Leicester, Kevin Richardson from Watford, myself from Colchester. So he knew what was going on in the lower leagues. He knew that there was talent there. And I can remember when I sat down with him and, you know, it wasn't negotiations because I just like, did what I was told and signed basically. But um, <laughs> yes, I remember him saying, I've watched you. He said, you're raw. He said, um, but he said, I can make you into a player. He said, there's one thing that I can't put into someone is desire and heart. He said, I'm going to have a team that is full of desire and heart. And anybody who doesn't show me that won't be playing. And that's what he did. That's what he built. Our, our team was built all around hunger and desire and very, very good players who became even better players under George Graham. If you think now, you, you, in the, you obviously follow the media, you think how many ex-Arsenal players are doing media work now, whether it be punditry, whether it be managerial and coaching, um, like there's myself, Paul Merson, Ray Parler, Steve Bold, assistant manager, Nigel does it, Lee Dixon does ITV, Martin mm-hmm. Cowan's on BBC, uh, Dave Seaman has just started doing talks for at the minute, Wright is obviously um, doing his punch. So there's loads and loads of ex Arsenal players. And the reason being is they all know the game because we were doing our coaching badges whilst we were training. We didn't realise we were doing our coaching badges. But we was taking all the information in from George. And he, yeah. if it wasn't for him, I know you say, obviously, you know, you know Arsenal and, you know, thank you, lucky stars that you do. But if it wasn't for George Graham, then we wouldn't have been at the Emirates because he put the pride and passion back in where the club was drifting a little bit. Yeah. And, and I actually bumped into George Graham a little while ago, actually, in a, a currency exchange shop. Mate. He's a lovely gentleman, I've got to say. Um, so, class. class. He has. Yeah. Wait, thing is, it's like, now when we see him now, we were so... Um, uh, I don't know if frightens a word, but we, he, he was a dictator. We called him Gaddafi. He was a dictator. He, if you didn't do it, Paul Davis cr- criticised him in the paper once. He had a row after a game and he criticised our style of play. We didn't see Davo for 18 months. We thought he'd been transferred and he was training with all the cows and the sheep in the top field. And then all of a sudden he came back training with us. We thought, oh, all right, Davo, where you been? <laughs> thought you left. So you didn't, you didn't cross him. Yeah, discipline. That's it. Yeah. Um, Moving forward to the 5th of April, 1987, Arsenal were victorious in the League Cup final. A 2-1 win over Liverpool, played in front of 96,000 people. Um, you were credited with the assist for Charlie Nicholas's winner. What do you remember of that day? Um, it was a bit surreal for me, really, because beginning of the season, I was playing for Colchester United. Uh, my last game then was against Exeter City in front of 1,200 people at Lower Road. And then fast forward it, to that eight for the uh, next year in April, I'm running out with my boyhood team who I'd supported and all my family supported. Uncle Vic was captain um, in front of 96,000 at Wembley in a major cup final. You know, so it's a bit sort of surreal, really. And back then, the League Cup was a major cup final because all the uh, English teams were banned from Europe. So you could only win the League, the FA Cup or the League Cup yeah. and playing against Liverpool, which were huge because they were the best team in the League and probably in Europe by a million miles. Um, so I mean, it was great for the Arsenal fans because we hadn't won a trophy for eight years so to be part of that and um, be involved in setting up Charlie for the winning goal and getting Charlie a new two year contract which he never thanked me for <laughs> but um, just remember Kenny Sansom hoofing the ball up the left touch line um, and me just making a run across which I was told to run in behind their centre arms and the full back and then just sort of skipping along the wing and I could feel that Gary Gillespie was coming like trying to slide and slide tackle me and he committed himself like too early I pushed it one way and jumped over him I think he's I think he's still actually now going for a hot dog and a can of coke as we speak because <laughs> he, he went so far off the pitch and then I remember getting into the penalty area and my, if it had been on the right hand side I would have shot but it was on the left hand side and my, my left foot wasn't the strongest so I was aware of Charlie unmarked in the middle, so I just rolled it. Well, to be fair, again, unusually for me, my, my final pass was pretty good. <laughs> I remember rolling it to him, and he got the, um, it was the old Irish snooker player, wasn't it? It was the old Rick O'Shea. He had about um, two or three deflections. Wrong-footed Bruce Brogan. It was the most, uh, it was the uh, most beautiful slash ugly goal you've ever seen. They all count, um, don't they? It doesn't matter. In that, yeah, we ended up winning 2-1. Um, the first time Liverpool lost after Ian Rush had scored. 
Um, again, George was a tactical genius on the day. And that, that put us back. You have to win your first trophy. That, that, that gives you belief that you can win the huge game. So make no mistake, in Arsenal's modern history, that, that cup final was huge, which helped us go on and win even like more trophies. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And the semi-final was against Spurs, wasn't it? And I'm always hearing my dad talking about that game, how he went to White Hart Lane for the replays. And I mean, how sweet was it to win that at White Hart Lane? Well, it was, it was weird for me because I was different. We, I played in um, the home league. We lost 1-0. Um, and then I didn't play in the two away legs because I was injured. I had a, uh, an ankle injury and they won both those 2-1. So that was the difference, really. Why not yeah, play? That's so that it, exactly. <laughs> but it was, um, it was a toss of a coin uh, when the, the second leg went to 2-1, you know, where we played at uh, Highbury, where we played at White Hart Lane. And um, obviously it was back at White Hart Lane. And we could remember at half time... Um, they started playing uh, the old Chaz and Dave Aussies on his way to Wembley. And uh, the stadium announcer put it over that if you had your vouchers from the last uh, two home cup games, uh, you can get your Wembley tickets. Oh, so, <laughs> George, that was halfway through our team talk. So, George uh, Gaffer just went, he was going through his, you know, his rant, basically. And he went, well, hold on a minute. He said, you listen to that. So, he said, if that doesn't wind you lot up and inspire you, like, nothing will. And... Rest is history. That's that's typical Spurs, though, isn't it? Just jump in the garden. Uh, yeah, a little bit flash. Typical. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and they they had a really good team at, at that time. Do you know what I mean? They had um, like Ardiles, Hoddle, Waddle, Nico Klassen, uh, Clive Allen, Paul Allen, Graham Roberts, um, Ray Clements in goal. So they had um, a real top team. We saw them as the big time Charlies. Um, and we were the young sort of upstarts, you know. So we just thought we'll give you a kick in, and that's what we did. Lovely, it worked in the end, and that's all that matters. Um, yeah. So having tasted League Cup glory that season, I'd imagine it would have been extremely difficult to take the final defeat in '88 at the hands of Luton Town. Now I've watched the highlights of the game. Am I right in saying it just wasn't your day? Me personally, or as a team? Uh, the, the team <laughs> and, and Both. the team. Yeah. Yeah. Well. It was weird. I blame Nigel because he missed the penalty. Do you know what I mean? So it's all these And Gus Caesar because he fell over the ball. So. <laughs> um, but we, I hadn't had a particularly good game. We hadn't played particularly well as a team. But we were still two and up. And I remember getting the hook. Um, and um, George Graham at half time went for everybody and told us how badly we were playing and to liven up. He looked at me and said, and you? He said, you've got about 10, 15 minutes. He lied. I think he took me off after 14 minutes in the second half. <laughs> and I remember walking off and Alan Smith said to me, Grimes, he limped. So, so people think you're injured. So I remember sitting on the bench um, and just sitting there thinking, well, I've had a nightmare. But obviously Hazy came on and scored and smudged them. We're two and up. I think, well, another winner's medal. No one cares if you've had a stinker, if you win. And then Nigel yeah. obviously missed the penalty. And then they got, it was, that was probably the, the, the lowest of my Arsenal career. Because when you lose at Wembley, it's horrible. It's yeah. like you just can't wait to get out. The year before, it was fantastic. You want to go on 20 laps of honour. But that, you just, and you can't get drunk. You can drink as much as you like afterwards, but you've got no chance of getting drunk. <laughs> um, and then he made one change. We played Sheffield, Sheffield Wednesday away the following Saturday, and the squad went up. He said, I made one change, and there was only one player that wasn't involved, and that was me. So obviously it was my fault. <laughs> so, yeah, it wasn't, not good memories. No, not a, not a great day, not at all. Um, obviously, following that disappointment, Arsenal were to go on and make history in the 88 89 season. Um, now, you just nailed down a position in the side the year before. So, were you at all disheartened when Brian Marwood came into the club? How did you keep going and pick yourself up? Well, the thing is, I'd been playing because I was a right wing and I'd been playing left wing. And we'd, we'd had a half decent season, you know what I mean? We'd, I think we'd come fourth and obviously lost the uh, Littlewoods Cup final. And then Brian scored. And any player, when you hear him being interviewed and they're asked, um, you say, you say you're centre forward and you have a, another centre forward joining. They say, yeah, it's great. We want as many good players as we can get in the squad. You know, it's all about being at a big club. They're lying. You yeah. don't want anybody to be signed when they're in your position. <laughs> you know, you've got more chance yeah. of not playing. <laughs> and to be fair to Brian, when he, he came in and he had a brilliant team, he was, he was pivotal that season because, uh, he scored a few goals and he made a lot from his, his crosses, uh, for Alan Smith, you know, and taking corners and free kicks. So I become, he's sort of a stunt man, really. Um, and I think I, I played 19 games in all, um, I think six, four once and scored four goals. So I did have my little bit of, you know, 
sort of a little bit of a say, and I wasn't a major player by any means, but I still felt that I contributed. Yeah, um, certainly. And and you're only as good as any squad that wins a title. You're only as good as your squad players, because That's right. if you haven't got strength in depth, then you ain't going to win a league title. That's right, definitely, to completely agree. Now that famous night at Anfield will forever be remembered. Was there a belief within the camp ahead of that fixture that you could go there and get the job done, or, or did it only really kick in once you were a goal to the good? No, there was. Um, we knew we were a good side. Um, we thought we'd blown it, to be honest. If, but I think Leroy Rashina scored West Ham's goal um, when they got beat 5-1. So that meant we had to win by two key goals. If we hadn't scored, we had to win by three, and that was never going to happen. Um, and... There's only one person who really believed that we could actually go and win once that was in the short round. He had that belief. We thought we could beat them, but no one beat Liverpool by two clear goals in Anfield. It just didn't happen. Yeah. Um, and the year, sorry, that season, we'd drawn one all against uh, Liverpool in the League Cup up at Anfield. And we'd actually battered them. We should have beaten them three or four one. David Rowcastle, God bless him, he scored a, a wonder goal, smashed it in the top corner. And that gave us a little bit, a little bit, bit of belief that we knew we could beat them. And, it, and conversely, it meant Liverpool had a bit of doubt. They knew that we believed we could beat them. So it, it, it was all about belief. But to win by two clear goals, no one really thought that. And to be honest, that actually took the pressure off. Because if we had to win, that was feasible. Do you know what I mean? We knew we could win. But winning by two clear goals, no one gave us a chance at all. Apart from, as I say, the one who had that innate belief, and it was George Graham, was the gaffer. And he... And we thought he'd gone mad because he played three at the back. <laughs> um, played three centre centre-halves. And Paul Merton looked to me and went, is he on what I'm on? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and we went up there. The game plan went perfectly, nil-nil at half-time. And he said, uh, after his only team talk I've ever heard him give at half-time, we didn't give anybody a rollicking. He said everybody was brilliant. He said, you've carried out my, my um, instructions to the, to the letter. He said, you, three centre-halves look really good. He said, obviously, Nigel, the plan was to push Nigel and Lee Dixon on to their wide boys, on to Ray Houghton and, John Barnes, which had happened. Yep. He said, maybe we could hold the ball a bit better. We weren't really goal for it. Um, but he said, it was brilliant. He said, and trust me, he said, if you nick a goal, he said, the momentum will change and they will start to get tense and they will start to think this is ours to lose. And when Smudge glancing off his hooter, <laughs> he was 100% right because I saw the tension go into like, well, like Alan Hansen, obviously um, uh, John Barnes, Steve McMahon, Ronnie Whelan. Do you know what I mean? That these top, top players I saw the, the tension actually fill their bodies and it, they, they did. They felt the pressure, you could tell. Yeah, certainly. And I mean, no one can ever doubt your contribution because you, in fact, helped create the space for Michael Thomas's clincher. So talk about impact player, Perry, you know? <laughs> well, it's funny to say, you must have done your coaching badges because I took the whole back four away. They knew where the danger was. So I just did what I was told, made a run over to, uh, like, uh, towards the left flank, so to the right flank and... Um, John Lukic, um, we were chatting for him to boot it, and he reckoned he didn't have enough energy to boot it. So um, he rolled out to the, And that was all. If you look at that goal, that, uh, that movement had been practiced a thousand times in training. That all went into muscle memory from Lukic to Lee Dixon. Lee Dixon looking for two uh, forwards, like me making a running behind Smudge, Smudge showing, him holding it up, trying to bring Mickey Thomas in. Mickey Thomas making a third man run. So that was by no means a fluke. It was all muscle memory from the player. It just went into like a robotic uh, state. And then it opened up for Tomo and it seemed I was watching from the right wing. I became a fan and it, it, it went inside. People say that all the great sportsmen, you know, the, the great, their great moments, it sort of, their brain slows down. It goes in slow motion. And all of the players on the pitch, Arsenal players, said it felt like an eternity for Tomo <laughs> to like get himself into the box. We're all shouting, of six feet, at him to shoot. Oh, God, <laughs> shoot, Tomo. And in the end, he waited and waited and waited and flicked it over. And trust me, that's the greatest goal ever in Arsenal's history. Because, and it couldn't have failed to a better person because if Tomo would have missed, it wouldn't have changed his life. If it was me, I'd have had sleepless nights for the rest <laughs> of my life. But Tomo was so laid back and he, he proved what a courage he had and a heart that he had and what you need to have to play for Arsenal because 15 minutes before that, he'd missed an absolute sitter. Yep. So for him to put himself in that position shows massive courage. If he'd have missed it, he'd remembered for the rest of his career as a player that missed a chance to win the title. Um, and then it was mayhem. We all, I went to the Arsenal fans um, to the left-hand side of the goal, just dived in there. And then you think, oh, right, we've still got another like three, four minutes. And then they attacked. God knows why. 
Um, but when uh, Tomo scored, God knows why John Barnes didn't run the ball in the corner. So we got him to thank. Then they attacked again. And um, the ball dropped out of the sky and Mickey Thomas just flicked it back to John Lukic. <laughs> Tomo, what are you doing? Um, yeah, and that's it. Final whistle blew and then, as I said, carnage. And that was it. Yeah, carnage, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Lovely stuff. And, and, you know, I've watched it back a thousand times and I even get emotional watching it. And it, it's sort still of before makes my time. Still the hairs on the back that's of your neck go up. Exactly. Still that's makes it. it. And you still think he's going to miss. That's it. I've, I've got the season review on one of those old VHS tapes. And I used to watch it over and over again. Yeah. But, you know, I'll it still, still looks like he's going to be tackled. That's it, exactly, exactly. All right, fast forward a little bit further to the 1990-91 season. A second league title secured in three seasons, now losing just one game. And in many ways, that campaign is kind of famous for that brawl which took place at Old Trafford, particularly amongst the general football fan. Would you say that that team was spurred on by a sense of injustice, seeing as United were only deducted one point whilst we were stripped of two? Well, it means that we won the fight, obviously, so that's why. Yeah, <laughs> <We got more. laughs> that's but, right. No, it wasn't, it wasn't much that. We couldn't work, work out why there was two points. And they obviously thought that we'd instigated it. And it was, um, to be fair, if you look at the broad handers in past, throws a couple of great sort of right-handers. And it all comes from Brian McClare and Nigel on the floor. But if you looked at that, that showed team spirit because everybody piled in. And yeah. if you're walking down, that, that epitomizes our spirit. Because if you're walking down the street and someone punches your mate, you ain't going to run away. No, You're going to help right. your mate. And exactly what happened. And I can remember in the dressing room afterwards, actually, it was a 23-man brawl. There was one person who wasn't involved. And that was me, because I had my glasses down my sock, and I thought, I can't be bothered to get over there. <laughs> over there. So put my glasses because I'm a lover, not a fighter. So, um, <laughs> and then we, we came into the dressing room afterwards. And um, like, obviously, he knew it was in the The gaffer knew it to be big news. He went, that's what I want. He said, that's what I want for my team. He said, all piling in. He said, no one like, tries to bully us when we come up north. They think we're southern softies. That ain't happening. He said, I'm proud of you. Like, he said, right, lads, that's what I'm saying in here. He said, when I go out there, I'm going to have to condemn all of you that you, um, you get the Arsenal shirt down and you will be fined. <laughs> you find them on two weeks' wages. So, <laughs> secretly, you know, he was great. He, he loved it. He loved the, that team spirit. Yeah. And he knew that that would take us, you know, sort of even further. So, um, and to only lose one game, that, that, that team is an all-time great Arsenal team, which never really gets mentioned. Yeah, Because, um, say, only losing one game, that was bold as Hawks, who went off against Chelsea at half-time. And people forget, Tony Rowan was winning, uh, captain winning prison in, in the December. Yep. Um, and didn't come out until uh, end of Jan. Um, so we missed him, and Linden came in. And as I said, you're only as good as your squad players. So, That's right. Um, yeah, that was, that, was a, that was a huge season for us. Yeah. And I mean, talking about that, you know, the team spirit, that's if you look at a more modern example was the Invincibles, you know, when that whole thing happened with Rude Van Nistelrooy and Martin Keown sort of leaped on his back and all that. And I always said the same thing, you know, it was brilliant to see them all fighting for each other. You know, yes, yeah. it's not ideal behavior, but you, you who don't cares? condone it. Yeah, you, you, don't, condone you don't condone it. Condone it but fans love to see their team sticking up for each other. That's right. Fans love to see, if, you know, any team you play for, you stick up for your teammate. And that's exactly what they did, at, uh, again, at Old Trafford. Um, and it's no coincidence that Matt, Matt Martin Keown, obviously Ray Parler was involved, Rat, Tony Adams was involved with all those players before, and, and they instilled that spirit into the new players that came in, <laughs> into yeah. the likes of Terry Omri and Manu Petit and um, uh, Over Mars and... Thierry Henry, I said there, and Vieira, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So they were told in no uncertain terms what it was and what it meant to play for Arsenal. And then they then absorbed it all and then they, they knew it, they got it. That's right, that's right. Now, as I said in your introduction, you truly are a cult hero amongst Arsenal fans. And I read a story that the fans launched a, a campaign to make sure that your biography outsold Ashley Coles, which is brilliant. Um, and, I, you know, I'm sure it would have outsold his anyway, because realistically, who wants to... And Stephen Gerrard and Frank Lampard. I don't Brilliant. want to talk about it, but... Brilliant. You know. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> uh, who wants to listen to those guys anyway? But how did that make you feel? Because, you know, that, that was 14 years after you left the club. So to still hold such a strong place in the supporters' hearts, how does that make you feel? Um, very humble, uh, very proud. Um, I think what it was... It, Oh, it was, I like to say it was brilliant marketing from John Bank Publishing, you know, that mine released the same as he's. But it was lucky because mine on what my book was about how privileged and lucky I was to play for Arsenal. And Ashley Cole's book was about how privileged and lucky Arsenal were to have Ashley Cole. Yeah. So you had two different ends of the spectrum. And obviously, it, it, uh, Cassie Cole was coming out, wasn't it, about, you know, you need to crash his car. He's on 60 grand a week. You know, and I was on 60 grand a year. <laughs> so there's a difference as well. 
Um, and I think Arsenal fans, you become a better player when you stop playing because they don't show all of your misses on uh, YouTube. They just show your goals. Yeah. So, you know, people sort of look at that fondly. And I think as well, with me, they looked at, they knew I was a fan playing for Arsenal. They knew if they played for Arsenal, they'd have to do what I did. You know, you'd have to run around and you'd have to put 100% in. When you watch Tierra Marie play, when you watch Liam Brady play, you know, when you watch Paul Merson play, they'll do things that fans know that they could never do. Do you know what I mean? And that's, you look at them in wonder and you think, oh my good God, did you see that? But I think with me, there was an empathy there because they thought, right, Grosey, yeah, he's, he's not bad, maybe not the most naturally talented, but when he plays, he runs around and he's a pest. And I think that's how, you know, fans would, and I made the most of what I had. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I dragged everything out. I remember people say to me, a lot of, there's a lot of jealousy that goes around and they come and have, try and have a dig at me if I'm out and about. Oh, look, Grosey, you overachieved. You didn't think he was that good. And I say, thank you very much. And they look at me and say, what do you mean? Um, thank you. I said, we told you, said I overachieved. They went, yeah, we did. I went, well, I'd rather be an overachiever than an underachiever. Exactly. And then they look exactly. at me and go, oh, dude. I think, yeah, you ain't really got it, mate, have you? <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's humbling. Great. Great stuff. And, and I, I haven't actually got the book. I'll hold my hands up, but I'm going to get it because... I've got a list of Arsenal books I'm working my way through at the moment. I think they're in Poundland at the minute. It'll be all right. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, they, I don't know where the closest Poundland is. I'll have to look that up. Um, moving on to, to modern day Arsenal. Now, obviously, last summer brought massive change at our beloved club. Unai Emery replaced the legendary Arsene Wenger. What have you made of the Spaniards' start to life in North London? I've been really impressed. Like, he reminds me of George Graham. Very much so, even like with his blazer, you know what I mean? Same sort of dapper style. Um, I think he's like George Graham in he's very tactically astute. I think he's very disciplined. He's exactly what Arsenal needed because under Arsenal, he'd become a little bit too comfortable and maybe a bit too complacent, where, you know, he's completely the other way around. Um, he wants to play a high-pressing, sort of uh, fast-paced game. We're covering more ground. I think that more about the road, the only team in a minute who cover more ground than we do, so that's a big sea change. He's not afraid to drop big names, you know, just because you're, you know, Mesut Ozil or Bamiyang doesn't say you're guaranteed a place in the side. If you're not working, then you don't play. He's not afraid to make massive decisions. And um, against Fulham, um, when Aubameyang's on the bench and obviously Iwobi played, Danny Welbeck played, Lacazette was up front, Mkhitaryan played, he actually picked a team to combat what Fulham's strength were. And that's, that's you know, quite refreshing to see. And we were ruthless against Fulham. I think it was seven shots, five goals. Uh, we're getting the ball in the box a lot earlier now. We, we don't look for the, you know, the second, third, or fourth pass. Yep. So that's come from, you know, I mean, people are saying to me, oh, you're getting carried away. You don't play anyone yet because you won nine on the trot. And my answer would be, if I can't get carried away when my team have won nine games on the trot, when am I going to, as a football fan, when are you going to get carried away? Yeah. Exactly. You, you know, you put up with enough, like, like downtimes. And I'm not saying, that we can win the title. I know defensively we still need to tighten up because the players aren't used to wanting to play out from the back. But we're closer to top four now than what I thought we would be at this stage. At the, at the beginning of the season, I thought he's got a free season to get you know uh, his tactics installed. Yep. Uh, he needs free transfer winners to get the players out that he wants, get the players in that he wants. I thought we'd have a great chance when you're Europa League, which I still think we have. But we, we are a lot closer to that that third and fourth place position now than I thought we would be. So, you know, it's all looking good. Yeah, it bodes well at the moment, doesn't it? And it, like yeah. you said, it's nice that you have to enjoy these times. You have to be positive. We've had a few seasons now where the fan base has become a little bit toxic. And, uh, you know, now's the time to unite. And I think this change has, has done that, to be fair. Very much so. And I, I'm very much in the Arsene Wenger camp. What he did for our football club will never be seen again. And people have to remember, by the way, my two boys, Lewis is 28, Drew's 26, right? Both massive gooners. My job as a father is to brainwash your kids. To yep, talk exactly. things. I've done that quite nicely. And um, there's, a, there's a generation, I'm not saying it's yourself, but there's a generation of Arsenal fans um, that have got a sense of entitlement. Because yeah, we're Arsenal, right. we should always win in massive trophies. Arsene Wenger, my two boys have seen their team win the FA Cup seven times before they're 30. That's incredible. In its, without the Invincibles, without the league titles, without the doubles. Yeah. You know, so um, we don't have a divine right. We should always be challenging to win trophies and titles, absolutely. But you don't have a divine right to win them. And um, the stick that he got, you said it was toxic, which is the right word, I thought was disgraceful from some quarters before what that man did for our football club. But it, had got, it was time for him to go. It, yeah. You know, it had got a little bit too complacent. 
Um, and say Emery's, you know, Emery's a completely different type of manager and that's exactly what's needed. <laughs> Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I am one of those entitled gooners. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to deny it. Um, you know, I, it's just a generational thing, isn't it? I guess if you've grown up seeing Arsenal at a certain level, then of course, that's that's what where your expectations are. Well, if but you yeah. look yeah, at your history uh, and Arsenal's history, we weren't particularly good in the 50s and 60s. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're a massive club, but not, you know, not winning trophies. Um, so... I mean, in the end, Arsene Wenger was probably a victim of his own success. Yeah, definitely. Because of the standards. And he was 10 years ahead of everybody when he first came to Arsenal. And you can't stay 10 years ahead because people copy your ideas. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. And eventually the playing field caught up. Um, and, and I guess that's what happened. Right, that brings us to the final segment of the show. It's been brilliant chatting to you, Perry. I've really, really enjoyed it. Um, but now it's time for our quick fire round. So I'm just going to fire some quick questions at you. And uh, just the first answer that comes off, off the yep. tip of your tongue. Um, so starting with best player you've ever played with. And has been par for one season. Okay. Toughest ever opponent. Uh, Paul McGrath. If he didn't have bad knees and drink problem, God knows how good he could have been. <laughs> Single greatest achievement? Um, it'd have to be making my debut for Arsenal. Lovely. That's a good... I, I like that when people say that, as opposed to a, a trophy they won. Um, funniest moment of your career? Um, I got knocked out uh, when I was on the bench at Hillsborough for Arsenal, where we scored. Nigel went and scored a P-roller, and we all, <laughs> everybody jumped out of the dugout. I jumped up, and it was metal... Um, Ouch. frame and I knocked myself out and George Graham said to Gary Lewin the physio get Groves he warmed up get him on he went he can't he's knocked himself out <laughs> he's <concussed. laughs> I had, a, had a massive egg like cartoon egg on my head so yeah so it was that <laughs> and the uh, Sheffield Wednesday fans found it quite funny and yeah. if I was him so would I yeah I'm sure they did <laughs> yeah. if you could pick one of your former teammates to hit the town with on a night yeah. out who would it be Murph <laughs> we always did <laughs> we always if he was me and him together if I was with him he always got in trouble. If he was me, I always got in trouble. So we were always out and about. I'm, I'm just pleased there's no mobile phones in those days. Yeah, imagine. <laughs> um, dressing room joker, who would it be? It'd be? To be fair, we had loads of big personalities like, um, like Merce, myself, Wrighty when he came, Ray Parler, you know, he was like the youth team coming through. So there, there was loads of big characters in there. Roger, Tony Adams, you, uh, every, everybody... The, um, the band just bounced around. Do you know what I mean? No one was um, too big a plan not to get hammered. Yeah. Um, but it would probably be Merce and myself, I reckon. Okay. And finally, Mr. Serious. Who was Mr. Serious in the dressing room? Uh, Davo. Paul Davis. Um, he, had a, he had a sense of humour, but he was, he was especially with the, the, the younger black players coming through, he was, they used to call him Pops yeah. or Uncle Davo. You know, he was uh, their mentor sort of thing. So, um, yeah, Davo, and he could throw me and right hook as well as the So he was, he was proper, serious, and hard, Davo. Good, great stuff. Perry, thank you so, so much for coming on. I can't even my pleasure. put into words how grateful I am, honestly. Um, and hopefully we can speak to you again in the future sometime. Not a problem. Not a problem at all. My old man to be a Tottenham fan. I said, I'll leave you that, all right? <laughs> Lovely. Great way to end. Perfect. Barry, thank no you worries. so, so much. That was former Arsenal hero Perry Groves. What an absolute gentleman. Pleasure having him on the show. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. And you can find our podcast in all the usual places. iTunes, SoundCloud, Acast, FNX, and of course, YouTube now. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by Loserport.com. Stay tuned to the very end to hear a little bit about our partners. Meet our hero. He's a smart guy who loves sports and loves outwitting other people. Our hero needs to show the world his mastery of the game. Our hero does this by playing games at Loserpool. Our hero is you. Loserpool has two games. In the namesake, the games of an entire season are grouped together into weeks or rounds. After paying an entry fee, you choose one team to lose that week or round. If you're correct, you earn the right to repeat the process in the next round. But the catch is that you cannot choose a team a second time until all the teams have been chosen by you once. 
If you're knocked out early, you may re-enter the same pool by paying a penalty to make it fair for the other players. Or you may wait until the next pool starts in a few weeks. Razor pool is similar to loser pool in that the games of an entire season are grouped together. But in this case, you pay the entry fee and predict the outcome of all the games in that week or round. You will be ranked against all other players according to your accuracy. And at the end of each round, a predetermined percentage of players will be eliminated. There is no option to buy back into a pool if you are eliminated, <laughs> and so you will have to wait until the next pool starts to play again. In both games, the prize money grows very rapidly. The pool is allocated to the last man standing, or to add a little drama, to a small surviving group if they vote according to predetermined rules. Loser Pool is about community, friendship, fun and rivalry. Discuss and debate the games and events of the week with players from around the world. Invite your friends and co-workers into your own sub-pools and see who can outsmart the group and earn bragging rights. This is your moment. Create an account. Show your sports genius. Be the hero.